Good morning, everybody. Well, first, I, I would like to warmly thank uh, all the organizers uh, for inviting me to give this uh, this keynote lecture on uh, sparsity. Uh, this uh, sparsity is uh, something uh, we've been familiar in with uh, uh, within the field of uh, signal processing for a couple of years now. And uh, what I would like to invite you to do with me today is uh, to explore uh, its possibilities in uh, in a way that from the traditional uh, application in inverse problems to deep learning. But first of all, uh, uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, all the collaborators with whom I've had the, the chance to collaborate along these years. First, uh, in the Metis Panama team in Rennes, and uh, more recently in, at uh, the Leap Lab uh, in ENS de Lyon. And they, they really are the ones who did the, all the hard work uh, uh, under uh, underlying uh, what uh, I'll be presenting today. So first, uh, so let's let's talk uh, about sparsity. Sparsity, uh, uh, you're probably familiar with it, uh, and it's uh, first of all a natural objective in terms of uh, efficiency of use of uh, of different types of resources, be it in terms of bits, flops, or energy, or even uh, reducing the size of uh, silicon chips that we need to to use to uh, process uh, data. But what has become uh, uh, apparent in the last uh, two decades is that besides this being an objective, it's also a very useful prior. When you know that the data that you want to process is sparse in some domain, this is a prior that you can use to leverage, uh, uh, that you can leverage to identify some uh, latent variables, uh, even in cases where you apparently don't have enough uh, available um, uh, data. Now, the prime example is the case of linear inverse problems, and that has given rise to the notion of uh, compressive sensing. So historically, let me make it uh, in a very uh, short manner. Historically, when you encounter a linear model with fewer observations than unknowns, this is underdetermined, and uh, there's no way you can find a solution. And uh, a major achievement of uh, the first decade of the of this uh, millennium is that uh, when you know that your unknown uh, satisfies some sparsity prior and some assumptions uh, and you also have some assumptions on uh, the measurement system a uh, then you then there's a a bunch of uh, uh, nice properties that uh, that, that arise in terms of the ability to identify uh, your variable in a stable manner with algorithms that uh, are tractable. So this is uh, so in this case sparsity uh, brings two important features: interpretability, of uh, because you have guarantees on the output of these algorithms, and provable tractability of these uh, algorithms. So the uh, the question that we will explore together during uh, this uh, lecture is to what extent the tools that are now very well mastered in this field of linear inverse problems uh, uh, with uh, the notion of sparsity can be extended to leverage sparsity beyond this, uh, the, this domain. So a first uh, natural way of uh, going beyond linear inverse problems to go bilinear. Uh, as an example, let's consider the problem of blind deconvolution where you observe a signal that's the convolution of two uh, of two base signals, a filter and a source, for example, and assume that you know that this uh, the filter and the source are both sparse. So the question is, can we recover them uh, from uh, from the, the signal? This is blind deconvolution. So of course we we know that essentially this becomes an easy problem if one of the signals, let's say the filter. Uh, uh, S1 is known, and you want to recover the source S2, knowing that it is sparse. For example, you could use the uh, well-known L1 minimization principle, which has some guarantees in certain settings. So knowing that this works well, when the source is known, uh, you can recover the filter. When the filter is known, you can recover the source using L1 minimization. So it would seem natural to use an L1 minimization, a joint L1 minimization principle to do to perform a blind deconvolution of sparse signals. Does it work? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, together with Alexi Benichou and Emmanuel Vincent, we came up with uh, uh, a result that shows that the fundamental pitfall in uh, using L1 minimization in such a setting. Uh, 
The fact is that if you look at this optimization problem, then it always admits a trivial solution, which is really not the one you want. This solution is simply that you either take the filter to be your observed uh, convolution A and the source to be a arc, or the opposite. This is always a global minimum of uh, this uh, minimization problem. So uh, it is uh, under the hood is a, a property that comes with the bilinearity of the problem, which is a, a rescaling ambiguity in the formulation of your problem. Because if you have a pair of source and filter that is uh, feasible, satisfies your convolution equal to your observation, then rescaling the filters and the filter and the source arbitrarily doesn't change the feasibility. So, while, uh, so a consequence of this fact is that while you believe you're uh, optimizing the, uh, the sum of the L1 norms, in fact, what you're implicitly optimizing is the product of the L1 norms of your, uh, of your source and filter. And as a matter of fact, there's, uh, in, for this particular uh, binary problem with uh, this deconvolution problem, what happens is that the, there's, a, there, there's a simple inequality that shows that uh, the, that gives that the trivial pair that you don't want is, has a, a smaller product than any other pair of sources. So somehow what this tells us is the first lesson about extending the notion uh, and the tool set uh, of uh, sparsity beyond the, lin the case of linear inverse problem. Here it tells us that in some way we should be uh, cautious about uh, ambiguities and scaling ambiguities that appear in bilinear problems. Of course, they appear in bilinear problems and they will also appear in problems uh, which are involve more uh, more layers in a, if you want. And uh, a natural case of uh, a natural setting of problems with more layers is uh, problems where you uh, you want to, uh, to to manipulate fast transforms because uh, has uh, has been known for several decades now. In single processing, we manipulate many fast transforms, uh, uh, which have uh, associated to analytic uh, transforms such as the Fourier transform, the wavelet transform, etc. Uh, what really makes what, what is really behind the hood and makes the uh, this transform fast is because the, the corresponding matrix can be written as the product of a few sparse factors. So historically, this is design. I mean, they have analysis uh, to, to find the factors. But more recently, the, with the idea of using learning methods uh, everywhere we can, came the idea of uh, using these representations as product of sparse factors uh, to do approximation or learning fast transforms. These, uh, these products of uh, sparse factors, we've seen they cover many existing transforms. And uh, uh, when you have such a product, you can immediately get uh, speed ups and also compression in terms of storage. So the, uh, the idea of learning such fast transforms is that when you're given a matrix, which is not a priori uh, associated to a fair transform, you can seek a fast, uh, I mean, an approximation of this matrix as a product of sparse factors. This will uh, lead to uh, an approximate fast transform that you could reuse when solving inverse problems or etc. But of course, this uh, uh, finding this type of approximation is a multilinear problem with the same scaling type uh, of scaling ambiguities as uh, I've mentioned before. So people, various people have come up with uh, empirical algorithms uh, that, um, that succeed in certain settings, but this, uh, there's much less uh, established theory than uh, for, the, for the classical linear inverse problems. Of course, once you open the, uh, the, the Pandora box of learning, uh, you can, uh, uh, I mean, there's the keep word deep that uh, starts to appear. And uh, one can wonder how much sparsity can be brought into, uh, into deep networks. Because these networks, we know on the positive side, they're very expressive, uh, they can be tunable, and there's lots of empirical success. But uh, 
when you come to GPT-3 or modern or even more recent variants that have uh, nearly 200 billion parameters, they are not really resource efficient. So if you could prune them I mean, or constrain them to be sparse, uh, there would probably be uh, the ability to uh, get uh, better uh, balance between the between the, the, the computational efficiency and uh, the accuracy of the, the, the results we achieve with these uh, with these methods. And if we were able to really bring all the knowledge we have about sparsity for inverse problems in this type of setting, uh, we may hope to gain. Uh, to, to gain the interpretability, the ability to have algorithms with uh, performance guarantees, and that achieve also resource efficiency. So that's uh, that's the, um, the motivation for uh, the different uh, explorations that I will that we will go through together uh, during this lecture. So to begin with, let's uh, let's we'll have a look at. Uh, sparsity at the two-layer level uh, in a linear case uh, and uh, towards the end of the talk we'll, uh, uh, we'll uh, look dig further in the uh, notion of rescaling invariance uh, in true networks with the radio activation function. So if we go back to this bilinear type of problems where we we have a matrix and we want to fit it with a product of two matrices uh, that have some constraints. So we could impose that these matrices are tuplets uh, and sparse. This would correspond to the bilinear uh, blind sparse deconvolution problem that I mentioned before. But more generally, you can think of factorizing a matrix into a product of two matrices with constraints on the support, so the set of non-zero entries of these matrices. For example, you could have fixed supports, or more likely you could have, uh, you could impose that uh, the left factor, for example, has no more than k non-zero entries. It would be in the set sigma k of k sparse matrices, or that it has no more than k non-zero entries per column or per row, or no more per row and no more uh, per column than k non-zero entries, etc. I mean, you, you name uh, what, what seems appropriate. That's here, you're just making a wish list. It doesn't tell you how to solve the problem, but that's the variety of problems that we can express in this way. So sparse matrix factorization, as an input, you give your matrix A, uh, you specify the sparsity patterns that you allow, and the goal is to solve this uh, optimization problem. Of course, this, it's known that it's a hard problem because as soon as you bring sparsity, uh, there's uh, combinatorial uh, issues that arise, and more formally, it's been proved uh, uh, that this covers uh, sparse PCA, which is NP hard. So this, usually, this is believed to be NP hard because there's the difficulty of exploring the possible supports and finding the right one. But what happens if you if you know the support is if in fact your constraints on your factors x and y is that they have to be to have non-zero coefficients at a particular place. Well, this is related to, uh, I mean, in the in the case where uh, the left factor x is known, and the and the factor y is unknown but with known support, it's not to be an easy problem. It's a least squares problem, and you know how to solve it. Uh, now, if both uh, factors are unknown but with fixed supports. This is related to the so-called lottery ticket hypothesis, uh, where, which is essentially a heuristic observation uh, that when you want to, uh, to get sparse networks, a very common way to proceed is to learn a dense network and to prune the coefficients afterwards and to train again on the, uh, with the knowledge of the resulting support. So this hypothesis uh, somehow suggests that uh, finding uh, the, the coefficients once the support is known becomes easy. And the first uh, surprise that we had when uh, trying to formalize this is that it's not so easy, in fact. Uh, so when the support is known, HDD often works well 
but if we wonder whether it can prove that it works well, it's uh, then it's no longer uh, the case. And this is uh, related to questions about uh, um, how about the shape of the landscape of this function. So let me be back to this function. It's a function of variables x and y. Uh, so you can plot its landscape, and the landscape is uh, something that ha will have, uh, well, it will have a global minimum associated to a Bayesian of attraction. Here, uh, the lowest dry point uh, on uh, uh, the lowest point on dry land is uh, in the uh, in the, the Dead Sea. But uh, uh, so if you start in uh, optimization in this area, you will get to the lowest point. However, there are also spurious local minima uh, that are associated to spurious valleys uh, or spurious basins of attraction. And there's even uh, a more uh, weirder uh, settings, the notion of uh, spurious uh, local valleys that are not associated to local minima. Here, the, if you look at the valley that leads to the Mediterranean Sea, well, essentially it goes to the horizon, but never gets to the level uh, of uh, the, the Dead Sea. So what about our problem, our optimization problem with fixed support? So this, for this problem, uh, well, uh, the first uh, surprise that we got is, was to prove that it's actually NP-hard in contrast to the classical least squares problem where one of the factors is fixed. Uh, this is uh, obtained by uh, reducing, classically by reducing the problem, uh, an existing NP-hard problem associated to NMF. Uh, sorry, for, for two low rank matrix approximation with missing data. So on the one hand, this is hard, but uh, it's known from uh, classical sparsity that it's not because the general problem is NP hard that there is no uh, easy instances. So second thing uh, that was explored together with uh, uh, my student uh, uh, Tung and my colleague Elisa, uh, was to explore uh, the uh, the ability to find some uh, some particular instances that would be easy, and in fact they are in the easy conditions, uh, easy uh, instances. So I, I I can detail them later if you have questions. But in shortly to say it shortly, we could find some non-trivial conditions on the supports, uh, the support constraints I and J, uh, so that. Uh, we can guarantee, we can, we can explicit an algorithm to compute the optimum. And it's, a, it's really a polynomial algorithm uh, based on the SVD. And uh, we can also show that whatever matrix we want to uh, approximate with a product uh, X, Y with these supports, well, we can show that the landscape of the optimization, optimization function L does not have any spurious local value, and essentially doesn't have spurious local minima either. So, re, so to me, the striking point was that this is very different from classical least squares uh, in that it becomes NP-hard even when the support is known. Uh, but fortunately, there are cases where uh, we can, uh, uh, where conditions under which it becomes easy. Of course, it would be uninteresting if the, these conditions were uh, very trivial. So for very trivial cases, these conditions are satisfied. There is at least one non-trivial case where it uh, happens, uh, where the conditions are satisfied. Uh, now, something that uh, popped up uh, when uh, stating this theorem is that we're stating it as two different properties that there's an efficient algorithm and that the landscape is nice. Uh, but somehow, I don't know for you, but at least for me, before this work, my intuition was that these were somehow equivalent, that the reason why something is a problem is NP-hard is because there are local minima everywhere, that if there's no minima, it's, uh, it should be easy. It, 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 so are, are these really equivalent? Well, it turns out that no. Uh, we, uh, something we could also explicit is a, is a setting where we find two particular supports, I and J. And for these supports, we can explicit a set of matrices 
uh, of uh, so matrices A, so that when whenever A uh, the, the matrix A that we want to factorize is in this set, the solution to the factorization problem is practically computable because it's even known analytically. Uh, however, uh, we could demonstrate that there are matrices in this set where everything is known analytically, but there are matrices where the problem has a spurious value, and there are matrices where the problem has a spurious local minimum. So really, the shape of the landscape, the spurious values, and the tractability are two different questions. And this, uh, even though they may be related, is because we are used to think in terms of gradient descent for solving this type of optimization problems. But here, we have to remember that there's life behind uh, gradient descent. In fact, the algorithm that we came up in the previous theorem for easy instances of uh, this factorization problem is an algorithm that is not based on gradient descent. It's an algorithm that exploits the scaling invariances that uh, we have uh, seen before, exploits a, a, a lifting approach that uh, somehow embeds the problem into uh, an appropriate uh, space and uses the SVD to, uh, in an iterative manner, uh, to find the solution, uh, the optimal solution in the finite number of SVD steps. So, okay, that's a, that's a tractable algorithm, but well, how the maybe gradient descent is not so bad in practice. So, um, it would so to can, can we compare it with gradient descent? Well, uh, of course, we did the comparison, and here is uh, what it gives. So on the horizontal axis, uh, you have the runtime of the uh, algorithm. On the vertical axis, you have the approximation uh, quality in terms of, uh, of the, Frobenius, the log of the Frobenius norm. And uh, as you can see with uh, uh, the, the gray, red, and green dots corresponding to uh, different first order methods associated to gradient descent with various number of iterations. You, you, the best you get in this setting is with the plain gradient descent with various number of iterations. Here is the sort of Pareto curve you, you get. But with our uh, SVD-based algorithm, uh, which is, in a, you have a, with a very uh, reduced runtime, essentially the best approximation you, you can get. So th this uh, this applies to the this bilinear problem of factorization, but can also be applied in a in a more generic setting in order that uh, to uh, to multi-layer uh, factorization. In fact, uh, uh, in multi-layer uh, uh, factorization, there's a common support structure called the butterfly structure, which is a sparsity pattern that appears in many of the known um, of the, of the uh, classical fast transforms. So if you have a matrix associated to a classical fast transform, it can be written as a product of factors that have this uh, type of butterfly structure. So as a, as a test bed for the extension of our algorithm to the multi-layer case, we tested it and combined it with a higher hierarchical method for sparse factorization that uh, was uh, uh, proposed a couple of years ago. Uh, this method simply consists in uh, iteratively factorizing the matrix in terms of uh, one factor satisfying the constraint on the left support and one factor satisfying a very relaxed constraint, but that's compatible with being the product of the, uh, of the four right factors. Once you have this factorization, uh, and th this factorization you can do with uh, the, uh, well, a, a bilinear uh, factorization with fixed support. Once you uh, do it, you can further factorize this factor into two other factors, etc., etc. And it turns out that for the butterfly structure, you can show that each time you perform a factorization, there's a fixed known support for the left factor, a fixed known support for the right factor, and these pairs of supports satisfy the tractability conditions so the algorithms that we uh, design can be applied and probably works. Uh, 
Okay, so that's uh, that's a way of uh, leveraging sparsity in a multi-layer uh, setting, and so with performance guarantees, provided that we have support uh, with uh, the the appropriate uh, tractability conditions. So, of course, at this stage, you may wonder to what extent can I extend can I extend these ideas and use them for nonlinear networks? Well, we'll see how far we can go with that. But um, when we get there, we have uh, to remember uh, first a bit uh, of notations about neural networks. And most of all, uh, uh, the uh, how rescaling invariances appear in ReLU networks. So I probably uh, won't uh, uh, get into details because uh, now everybody is familiar with networks, which have are made of different uh, layers, some of them being hidden. Uh, they are, uh, the layers are made of neurons that we denote new here. And between layers are affine transforms. These affine transforms are associated to weights uh, on the edges and to biases uh, that are added at the output on, uh, on, uh, on each output neuron. And uh, on each hidden neuron, you apply a, a nonlinearity, which is the ReLU activation function when we consider ReLU networks. Something to remember is that for the rest of this presentation, I will use uh, theta as a shorthand for the parameters of the network. So the architecture is fixed, and theta simply denotes the collection of all affine transforms, that's the collection of all weights and all biases. That's a shorthand to denote the dependence of the, the network on the parameters. Once we have the description of the parameters of the network, there's the it's its realization is the function that's implemented by the network so when you take an input vector x in dimension d and you iteratively apply an affine transform nonlinearity affine transform etc you end up with an output vector which is the real which is f theta of x and the function f theta is the so-called realization of the network so what is important to know is that ReLU network have some invari invariances. So, th so there are uh, ambiguities in the parametrization because the, primarily the ReLU function is positively homogeneous. So the, the, it means if, if you scale the input by a constant positive scalar, then the output will be scaled by the same scalar. A consequence of this fact is that if you take maybe a neuron that's, uh, you know, you zoom in a network and look at a particular neuron uh, and look at incoming weights and outgoing weights. Then if you replace the incoming weights by the, I mean, you, you scale up the incoming weights by the positive factor and you scale down the outgoing weights by the same positive factor, then you don't change the behavior of uh, the, uh, uh, of the, the you don't change the realization of the network. So and since you can do this at each neuron, there's actually a whole equivalence class of parameters that are so-called scaling equivalent parameters. We will denote them uh, uh, like this. And if you have scaling equivalent parameters, they will be functionally equivalent in the sense that they, the networks, the corresponding networks, will have the same realization. So this is really related to this scaling invariance in the parametrization of blind deconvolution here. It extends in a linear case, in a multi-layer case, in a deep case to ReLU networks. So why is that important to consider this scaling uh, equivalence? Because on the one hand, it doesn't matter. I mean, you take different parametrization, they are functionally equivalent. However, you may have to uh, and we may have to insist on the fact that different parametrization can behave very differently if you, uh, when you perform a step of gradient descent or when we, you quantize them. 
And uh, this raises the idea that maybe it's possible within these equivalent classes of uh, scaling equivalent parameters to seek to navigate and try to find a particular parameter that will be will not change the, the behavior of the network. So the classification that you'll perform with the network will be the same and so on. But maybe if you pick up a particular one, uh, it can improve some other performance criterion. Maybe it will behave better to converge to uh, during SGT, or maybe when you quantize it to reduce the, the the budget, the bit budget to represent your network, maybe it will perform better. Maybe the maybe the the accuracy will be uh, less perturbed, uh, with uh, and you'll be able to quantize more aggressively. So. This led to the idea of uh, equinormalization. Uh, and uh, that's uh, in the context of uh, so SGD optimization. Uh, if you think of SGD as an iterative process, you perform SGD step, you get a parameter, and you perform another SGD step, etc., etc. Here, the idea is we will introduce a so called equinormalization step between two SGD steps. So that will change the parameter that we consider for the next SGD step without changing the realization. But this will change the gradient. And the intuition is that maybe it's possible to do this so that the gradient is somehow better behaved and drives us faster to the minimum or drives us to a better minimum. The heuristic proposed in this equinormalization uh, step was to choose a sort of canonical representer among the uh, equivalence class. So you're, you're given, you have a, a parameter theta, and now you're looking for theta prime, that's scaling equivalence. And uh, here the heuristic was to choose uh, one among these scaling equivalent parameters, one that minimizes some LP norm. So this LP norm was uh, defi is defined on the weights, not on the biases. And a priori, you can choose any P, and maybe the behavior, the empirical behavior, can be different for different values of P. So be careful here. Uh, traditionally, when we do this type of minimization with P bigger than one, uh, we know it's uh, it's convex, and we because it's on, under a constraint. Uh, which is uh, typically linear constraints. But here, the scaling equivalence is not a linear constraint. Yet, yet we can, uh, uh, what we could show in, the, in this work is that uh, this problem, when properly expressed in a logarithmic scale on the parameters, becomes a convex optimization problem. And uh, it gives rise to an algorithm that's similar or inspired by the synchron algorithm and that probably converges to the desired uh, canonical representants. So I, I could give some uh, details on the on the behavior of uh, the algorithm. All you have to know probably here is that, uh, well, it's better than, uh, I mean, improves of the batch norm. When you combine it with batch normalization, it improves over other uh, normalization techniques such as weight normalization and so on. Uh, uh, maybe uh, let's uh, take just the time to illustrate how it can be used. It has been used by uh, Nagel and its, uh, his co-authors uh, to, um, uh, to improve the quantization of networks. So typically here is the, for different uh, channel indexes, the range of values of the, the, uh, of the entries of a network before normalization and after normalization, here is the, the range that you get. What is important is to notice that here the range is between minus 100 and 100, and uh, some, some uh, ranges are very small, some are very large. Here, the, the dynamic range is much smaller and that makes it uh, much more compatible with, uh, with quantization. So in a way, what we've learned here is that uh, Yes, we need to be cautious about scaling equivalence, but it may be possible to harness it, to actually exploit uh, scaling equivalence. Once we know it is there, uh, we can try to, uh, 
to do it properly. Of course, there remains a lot of questions on how to, what, what is a good representer? What is a good LP norm? Uh, does it depend on the depth of the network? Uh, you name it. Okay, so we're getting closer to the end of uh, this talk. And uh, to, as a conclusion, I, I'd like to uh, shed the light on uh, one particular way of uh, handling scaling invariance uh, through a notion of lifting of embedding of ReLU network. So as a, as a warm up, maybe uh, le let's remember some properties of the realization of ReLU network. You've probably heard uh, or read that the function that's implemented by a network, a ReLU network, is as a function of the input vector x, a continuous and piecewise linear function. Perhaps you know, but it seems to be a bit less known, is that if you consider it as a, if you fix an input vector x and you look at the realization as a function of the parameters there, then it becomes a poly, piecewise polynomial function. Uh, but overall, there's this notion of scaling equivalence. So, so we can find different parameters, theta prime and theta. There are scaling equivalents. That so this scaling equivalence, as we have seen, that it always implies that the realization is the same. But it's not clear to what extent the, the opposite is true. Uh, to what extent equality of realization means that the parameters are the, sa are the same. And this type of question is important in certain settings where uh, uh, somebody is able to observe the output, the, the input output relation of a network. Uh, and uh, the, whether do you, uh, do you want to be sure that you can reverse engineer this or not? Uh, because the par knowing the parameters may reveal something on the, on the data that was used to, to train it, for example. Anyway, these uh, two properties, scaling equivalence or functional equivalence, they define equivalence classes. And uh, it's a bit inconvenient to manipulate them uh, usually. So uh, if we want to take it into account during optimization, equinormalization is, uh, is a way. It would be even better if we could have a, a sort of explicit finite dimensional representation of our parameters so that scaling equivalence would be actually equivalent to equality of these embeddings. Because in this case, you could try to directly optimize the embedding uh, when, uh, when, when training networks. Well, in, in, in fact, that's something that's uh, reminiscent of tools that are familiar in uh, matrix completion and um, in uh, phase retrieval that, uh, that come from our field of single processing. So if, if, you, if we get back for a minute to the shallow case, the shallow linear case where we have the parameter theta is just a pair of matrices for the first layer and the second layer. So the realization is a linear function, which is, I mean, essentially corresponds to a matrix, which is the product of this first and second layer. And rescaling equivalence takes the particular shape that the, the product of two matrices is the sum of the product of uh, columns of the second one by rows of the first one. But this product, this sum of products remains unchanged if you scale uh, rows of the first and uh, columns of the second matrix. However, it's known that it, in this uh, setting, we can use a so-called lifting uh, representation. Instead of using X and Y as your parametrization, if you use uh, the product of the first column by the, uh, by the first row, etc., you get R rank one matrices. And these uh, become, these rank one matrices, they are, are no longer subject to, uh, to these ambiguities by scaling, because if you, if you scale this by a scalar and this divide by the same one, the matrix itself is unchanged. So this, this is very useful to analyze identity problems. And this is, uh, uh, and with, uh, there, there's a nice work of, uh, uh, Joram Bressler and his team uh, from a couple of years ago for generic bilinear inverse problems, 
uh, that we've extended uh, recently uh, in an upcoming uh, draft uh, to, uh, uh, for the analysis of uh, exact sparse matrix factorization. But OK, that, that was just a warm up uh, to introduce the idea that if we do some lifting and use sort of uh, partial products uh, of, uh, of entries, and then we somehow get an invariant representation. So if we want to go to an embedding of network parameters that is uh, invariant, the way to go is to consider path in the network. So here is the architecture of the of, uh, of a ReLU network, and a, the a first set type of path is path, full path that starts from an input neuron ends in an output neuron. So there's a number of edges along this path, and we, for such a path, we can define uh, the value of the parameter as the product of the weights along the edges of this path. The second type of path is partial path that starts from a hidden neuron, go to an output neuron. And here you can define a value as the product of the bias on this neuron by all the weights along these neurons. When you combine, when you take the collection of all these values for all full and partial paths, you get an embedding. And it's possible to show, and uh, that's what we did uh, with my student Pierre Stock in a recent uh, preprint, that scaling for any parameters, scaling equivalence implies that the embeddings are identical and that the size of the parameters are identical, which in turn implies a functional equivalence. So that the, the realization are the same for any input vector there. So this the same on the whole space. Now, the reason for introducing this embedding is to also investigate the reverse question. To what extent does equality, does the knowledge of the realization imply that we know something about the parameters? But that's the hard direction. So it's, uh, it's not a new uh, question. It was explored uh, in the 1990s, uh, for example, for, by Pfefferman, uh, not for ReLU networks at the time, uh, but for the network with the uh, hyperbolic, hyperbolic tangent uh, nonlinearity. And it's been explored uh, from a more uh, algorithmic perspective uh, recently uh, by um, uh, Veronique and Curdy. So what can we say? Uh, uh, how can we exploit this, uh, this embedding? Well, first, uh, the, the left implication is actually essentially uh, an, uh, an equivalence because equality of the embedding and equality of the signs uh, implies scaling equivalence provided we restrict to admissible parameters with a very natural notion of admissibility where we we simply need to make sure that when you whenever you have a hidden neuron well it's connected with to the output and to the output with some path uh, made of uh, non-zero weights. Now, what about the other implication? Well, it's uh, well we can show that uh, characterize a notion of local non-degeneracy non uh, of the parameters, uh, such that if the realization of the network networks is the same on some finite sets. And if uh, theta is non degenerate then there's indeed uh, equality. Of course, the the more uh, the even harder question is that to what to what extent uh, this type of uh, inverse result uh, extends globally. So, does the real the equality of realization implies uh, the uh, scaling equivalence of parameters up to additional permutation equivalences? And this is something that we could uh, work out fully in the shallow case and so partially in the, in the deep case. So in the, in the shallow case, uh, what we wonder is what does it mean that a parameter is identifiable up to permutation and scaling uh, from its realization? Here, what we ask more specifically is can we identify it from the knowledge of its realization and some bounded sets. 
the reason what, why do we why consider a bounded set uh, simply because in practice if you have an algorithm you will always only observe probably a finite set of values of uh, your function and, and it, at least it will be bounded you will not observe more than the on a bounded set so here we have a full characterization theta is identifiable from a, a bounded set if it satisfies two properties the first property is is uh, that there should be no twin neurons. And here I need to define what is a twin neuron. So if you consider a neuron, you will feel a vector with the ink W with the incoming weight and complete it with uh, uh, the, uh, the bias. Now, two neurons new and new prime are twins. If this vector for the vector new is proportional to uh, the the same vector for the for, for neuron new, new prime. So the first condition for identifiability is the absence of two neurons. It's quite natural because if if you have twin neurons with a positive scalar, then essentially uh, the output of this neuron will be uh, the same as the output of this neuron up to a, a multiplicative factor that you can compensate with uh, other weights. Uh, um, so it's it's quite natural and it's a bit more intricate when the uh, neurons have a negative uh, to see why uh, this is also needed when you have a negative proportionality factor but you can find it the details in uh, our paper so that's the first condition the second condition is a condition that we call the irreducibility it's simply uh, and this condition involves also the output neuron, the, the vector of output weights. So for each neuron, you define the vector of output weights. And here what we ask is that when you do the product of the vector of input weights by the vector of output weights and sum it over any subset of hidden neurons of the same layer, well, it should never be zero. And this, uh, okay, this is, uh, I mean, this somehow says that some matrices of uh, the product, uh, uh, rank one matrices uh, uh, associated to a pair of subsequent layers have a sort of linear independence uh, uh, property. But, okay, we call it irreducibility. And it's, if you, your network is uh, parameter is identifiable, then there's no twin neurons and it's reducible and the converse is true. Now, in the general deep case, what happens? These conditions, they are still necessary, but you can show that you need more. There are more necessary conditions that somehow interrelate what happens in uh, different layers, uh, layers at uh, different depths. And uh, nevertheless, uh, when you look, look at local identifiability and not global identifiability, uh, we could come up with uh, uh, sharp characterizations in, uh, that do not involve the irreducibility condition. Okay, I think we've done uh, uh, quite a, a tour on, uh, on um, uh, sparsity from inverse problems to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to deep networks. And it's probably time that we wrap up. So what's uh, we to, to, to begin with, uh, uh, the first message is probably that uh, there's many things we know in the, the, the around sparsity for linear inverse problem that actually break down in a multi-layer setting. L1 regularization is no longer a good uh, a, a good proxy, and the main thing that it teaches us is that scaling invariances uh, should be taken into account. The second thing that we've established is that even finding the coefficients uh, when the support is known is in general NP-hard, and we, you ha we have to restrict to structured and uh, sparsity patterns to be back to settings where uh, knowing the support is really helpful. So this led us to uh, settings where we can uh, find ways to optimize that do not rely on the uh, SGD. And by the way, if you want to play with uh, these methods, uh, I invite you to uh, download the FOST uh, toolbox, FOST.inria.fr. And the last uh, message is probably that uh, the rescaling invariance is really something that needs to be 
uh, harnessed. And uh, we propose uh, as a tool a notion of embedding uh, that uh, allows to uh, notably to uh, to handle some identifiability uh, characterizations. So of course this is far from being the end of the story. And uh, among the upcoming challenges, uh, uh, I'd like to mention uh, uh, the uh, first this embedding uh, where we believe it has much more potential than what uh, has been uh, 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 described uh, here. Uh, it has also uh, uh, challenges in terms of the dimension of the embedding because there's uh, the number of paths is uh, enormous and much higher than the intrinsic dimension of uh, uh, parameters. So this calls for dimension reduction techniques and algorithms to actually manipulate this embedding, find good representers, etc. Uh, something that I find quite exciting is uh, also the idea that all these tools, they allow to consider identifiability problems. Why should we want, uh, worry about identifiability? Well, probably not necessarily in terms of uh, uh, the meaningfulness of the parameters, but if we want uh, to go to, towards explainable networks, uh, I think identifiability is... Uh, is, uh, is an important step because if the same network can be represented very differently, how can you use the properties of the network to infer some, uh, something, something relevant? And uh, finally, here we've probably only uh, tackled, uh, explored the, the, the tip of the iceberg because invariances in ready network, they are associated to um, to scaling equivalences, but when you go to modern architectures involving transformers, there are more invariances due to the fact that you, uh, the, to the particular structure of the attention layers. So uh, all the, this brings a very rich future, I think, uh, around the questions that we can investigate. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention uh, and uh, I'm um, open for your questions.